Now we're recording. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a fridge. And this fridge had one job. And its job was to keep things cold. It did its job well. Fridge Co., the company that built the fridge, was doing fine too, but they thought they could do better. So one day, as they often did, the Fridge Co. product team gathered to brainstorm. How could they differentiate themselves from the fridge competition? The product manager was frankly tired of hearing the same old ideas. Bigger capacity, more energy efficiency, more shelves. Nothing new, nothing exciting. It seemed like they've had this meeting a hundred times before, and they had. Someone across the table was looking at his phone, bored, and watching him rudely tap at the screen, she was suddenly struck with a totally new concept. Let's connect it to the internet. Silence. A fridge connected to the internet? Asked the guy with the phone incredulously. Yeah, that sounds ridiculous. No, she said, it's the future. It will have a bright color screen it will support apps, just like your phone. We can partner with recipe websites and integrate with Google Calendar. And Twitter's big, right? So let's put Twitter in the fridge. And so it was that Fridgeco ushered the humble fridge into the information age. Now I made all of that up. I have no idea if that's how it really happened. But it seems plausible because we do have the internet on fridges now, right? So somebody had a conversation along those lines at some point. But imagine now it's 10 years ago, it's 2009. The iPhone is barely a year old. And you're a software developer, as you likely are, and you get a call from Fridgeco. And Fridgeco is saying, hey, we put the internet on a fridge. We want, to, we want you to help us make this new vision of internet-enabled refrigeration a reality. So how would you go about implementing something like this? Well, 10 years ago in particular, you'd probably have to build a software development kit, an SDK, and a set of standards for building your app for the fridge. And competitors, of course, are going to follow suit. And Fridgeco isn't going to want to share its SDK with anybody. That's proprietary information. Why create an open standard for internet-enabled fridges? You're too busy just trying to get it out the door. So everybody cre creates these proprietary platforms, uh, and you do too. And so even more complicated, Let's say that you are a grocery delivery service, a startup, uh, and you want to plaster your app, of course, on all of these fridges because you want to be the very first thing that people see when they decide to order more milk or more eggs or whatever they're trying to do. So you want your app on all of the fridges, all of the fridge brands. Building an app from scratch is a pretty daunting task to begin with, but now you're looking at multiple proprietary systems and and standards that don't match up, and different SDKs and different brands. And you're having a hard enough time just getting your initial iPhone app out the door. Why do you want to think about building uh, an app for 10 or 20 or 30 different fridges? It's not that hard if you have the right technologies and workflows in place. If you centralize all of your products, your content, in a single consistent data model, and you've made that information available using a robust API, you can rapidly develop apps for all kinds of devices. So it seemed like a crazy idea 10 years ago, putting the internet on a fridge is almost trivially easy today. And it's not because we got really good at building fridges, but it's because we've created all of the underlying infrastructure needed to rapidly adopt new technologies whether they're fridges or streaming devices, home assistants, anything. Today, right now, we expect our digital interactions to span a variety of experiences and contexts. We are reading, watching, and listening to content. We're doing this on different devices, in different situations, and with different needs, like looking up recipes on our fridge. But before we get into the details and the predictions of what the future of content will hold, I want to define a couple of concepts. I mentioned experience and context. Experience is what happens inside of the content. It's the content itself. It's the medium itself. It's text, video, sound, 
and the content of the message that it's delivering. Context is everything outside of the content. It's the device you're using, the operating system it's running, the web browser you've chosen. It's the physical environment you're in, your history with that brand or office or entity. It's the needs that you're trying to meet. It's the mental model that you're using to compare this content to other content that you've experienced in the past. So context is everything around the actual core of the message in the medium. So that's experience and context. So to provide some examples, watching a movie is an experience. A movie is an experience. It's a piece of content with a message uh, delivered via a medium, film or television. But watching it in a theater with your kids or your niece or your nephew, or watching it on your phone while flying to a conference, or curled up on your sofa with your dog, these are the contexts of that experience. Different kinds of experiences with different people in different places with different purposes. Today I'm going to be focusing mostly on context, the latter, how we experience content, what is surrounding the content, and not the actual message of the content itself. So with this in mind, I'm going to make eight predictions. It's not an exhaustive list. It's just eight things that I think are really interesting about where we're headed next. And the first couple of, of predictions deal with some of the basic principles of technology and different kinds of architecture and content management systems and, and things like that. So let's get started. Prediction number one, CMSs will be content repositories, not website managers. So if we think back to 20 to 30 years ago, websites were flat files uploaded to a server via FTP. Content was tied to presentation. It was inside the file that was also what people saw and what was rendered in the browser. So these hard-coded files were, were being uploaded to, to web servers. And eventually, very quickly, this became cumbersome. So people started developing desktop applications like front page that allowed you to manage all these flat files. And then we had the first attempt at basically a web-based CMS, GeoCities, but in the back end it was still just saving a bunch of files to a file server. And in the 2000s, web-based CMSs became popular. Drupal was released in 2000, WordPress in 2003, .NET Nuke the same year, 2003, Joomla in 2005. These platforms really aren't that old, but around the 2000s is when these web-based CMSs arose. And they were a single piece of software running on a web server that divided, uh, that contained both the front end, the display of content, and the back end, the management of the content. And in the beginning, we could display content in a web browser on a desktop or a laptop computer. And then came RSS and Atom feeds, which allowed us to both syndicate content outwardly to other sites and pull content in using a standardized format. So it allowed for more content sharing between sites and services. And then of course the mobile revolution. And that mobile revolution around 2008, 2009 fundamentally changed our approach to front end design. Everything was turned on its head, but it did not fundamentally change our approach to content management. In fact, in some ways it fractured it and it forced some people to create multiple versions of their website, one to be mobile friendly, one to work with desktop. On the back end side of things, CMSs stored text, media, and user generated content, comments and blog posts and things like that. And as these became more popular, web administrators of these content management systems started demanding more back end functionality, naturally. And so we added things like user management, because if we have user contributed content, well, People will want to be able to create profiles, and, and now you have permissions issues and security issues, so now you need a, a whole permissioning system. Some people can access the admin side of the site, some people can't. Some people can only comment. Maybe you have to be logged in to, com uh, to comment on the site. Then, of course, website managers wanted layout tools. They wanted to be able to create new and interesting layouts without involving a developer or a designer in the process. And then we had to integrate all of these systems. We weren't just using content management systems. We had CRMs and, and payment gateways and single sign-ons and all of these other things that had to be integrated with the website. Well, look at this. This is huge. This is heavy. Uh, it's complicated. And, and fundamentally, in the 2000s, CMSs were no longer really about content management. They were about website management. 
or in some cases managing a commerce platform or a fundraising campaign or, or a community. Who here has been in the Drupal community long enough to remember when Drupal used to call itself community plumbing, right? Remember that? Haven't seen that in a while. So here we are in the late 2010s, and what we've seen in the last nine or so years is this incredible proliferation of devices, apps, and channels, new ways to interact with C content. And these new devices introduced new technologies like location awareness, GPS technology on you at all times, new interaction patterns like touch and gesture and voice commands. The number of people that use voice to search on websites is astounding. It may not, if you don't do it, it feels like nobody else does. Most people do. Statistically speaking, most people are just speaking searches into their phone and not typing it. It's pretty incredible. So these apps that have been created for these devices have elevated our expectations of, of user friendliness. We expect everything to have app-like capabilities and app-like functionality. And what we mean by that, of course, is it just needs to be really good, right? We've also seen these new channels for publishing content and engaging users. So media companies now have to contend with things like Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News, and other off-site distribution channels of their content. So in our scramble to keep up, we spin up all these new websites, apps, and tools to satisfy short-term and timely needs. And all of these new endpoints really just duplicate content, code, and effort. Not only did this greatly increase the effort and cost of maintaining our digital presence, but it leads to inconsistent, bare bones, and just plain bad experiences for our audiences. How many of you find yourself in this position right now? All of these different separate systems and websites that are all kind of clustered together, and you have to maintain all of them. Somebody gets frustrated and says, I'll just spin up a WordPress blog, that's all I need. Well, they set a precedent, and now you've got 10 people doing it, 20 people doing it. Somebody else comes along and says, I really like craft. Now you have to deal with craft on top of everything else. So this is the situation that a lot of us find ourselves in now. And we're already beginning to see the shift to a more agile approach to architecture, decoupling CMSs and centralizing content management. So for those of you who aren't really sure what decoupling means, and that's most people aren't, Here's a very simplified version of, of what that means. So here we have a traditional CMS, Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, all of these things out of the box, craft. It includes both the front end, the display of content, and the back end, the management and the storage of your content. And imagine we separate the two. And each is a separate piece of software. So yes, we are adding additional software to the mix. But these pieces of software are focused on very specific tasks. There's a piece that displays the content and a piece that manages the content. And this resulting architecture and what ties them together is what we refer to as decoupled. Some people call this headless. Some people make a distinction between decoupled and headless. But broadly speaking, this is what we mean. So when we talk about the front end, we're most commonly talking about your main website. So let's just label this the website. And when we talk about the back end, we're mostly talking about your content. So let's label this the content. And these two things, the, the head and the body, these two decoupled pieces, are connected by an API. And that API simply pulls content from the database at the bottom and turns it into markup when it's sent to the front end. This is actually what's happening inside every CMS that you've ever used. But in decoupling, we actually have two separate pieces of software. Quick misconception. Uh, that I want to uh, clear up. You don't need to rebuild your CMS to decouple if this is something you're interested in doing. Recently, we, re we decoupled the PRI's homepage while keeping their underlying site running on Drupal 7. We just added the front end on top of it and had Drupal 7 expose the content to that front end. And an interesting side benefit of decoupling that we didn't fully expect, uh, your team may be able to work with more widely understood code and design patterns. So if you pick the right kind of front end uh, solution, the people that you need to hire don't need to know Drupal's PHP template in Drupal 7 or Twig in Drupal 8. They just need to know markup, CSS, and JavaScript, very common front end technologies. So one of the project leads for PRI on the PRI side said, that it was the first time in years that their team had enjoyed working on the code base. So people get excited about this. 
not only is it potentially better architecturally and long term, but people really like doing it. It's fun. It's different. So when your site is decoupled, you centralize your content, meaning that you store all of it in a single place, regardless of how many websites you're actually operating or how many websites that content appears in. And you can then attach different sites to your content repository. This is where it becomes powerful. It doesn't make sense if you're doing it with just one site, but if you have multiple sites, like a microsite for an event, or a blog that is topic specific, or if you work in a university, a blog for a professor, or a line of research that you're pursuing or something. All of these can be attached to a content repository that everybody shares. And that same API that you built to decouple then connects that to all of the other front ends and sites. This is what we talk about when we say content centralization. Prediction number two is that content will be extensible and modular. So a modern CMS does not treat the website as the primary experience. A modern CMS, a modern architecture, is multi-device, but it is not designed for any specific device. This means you have to think about your content first and above all. Not thinking about your websites, not thinking about devices, but the content that you're actually trying to create and deliver. And you should let your CMS deliver structured content to let those devices, software, or apps handle the rest of the work. If your content is properly modeled, if you have reusable fields, robust content types, then you can very quickly support new devices and experiences. And one of the things that makes Drupal really powerful is the ability to quickly add new fields and content types. So let's say somebody comes along, you have this structure set up, you have a couple of sites that you're operating, somebody on your team comes along and says, hey, we need uh, an iPhone app and we want to be able to give people location-based content. Well, you're adding location-based content, you're adding that, that field, that piece of information to the content or to your site, you have now enabled location awareness for every other site and app that you operate. You're not adding it specifically for the iPhone, you're adding it to your model so it can be used by Android or any other kind of device. Let's say you want to add uh, streaming video support. Well, the metadata fields that you add to your streaming video, runtime and director and subtitles and all of the things that you need to do to uh, send your content to Roku, well, guess what? If you model this properly, you have basically built out the structure for your Apple TV app or a way to more quickly integrate with YouTube and upload videos directly to YouTube or Vimeo or other streaming services. So all of this stuff can be reused. If you add uh, conversational fields to, uh, for an Alexa skill now, you can work with things like uh, Google Assistant and, and um, Apple's uh, device, the name of which always escapes me. And then of course feeds and AMP, uh, accelerated mobile pages, these are very similar to Facebook Instant Articles and Apple News, and it's really kind of the same format. So if you extend it to one thing, you've, you gain all of this other stuff for free. That's the power of a centralized uh, content model. So an example of, of some work that we've done in this space, uh, we've been working with NBC for years and years to consolidate all of their content into a single content repository. Uh, so NBC delivers content to a lot of different devices, it has multiple websites, multiple, you name the device, they have an app, right? That all comes from one place. Whether you're watching NBC content uh, on Roku or Apple TV or on the website or on the SNL page or on Telemundo or wherever, it's all coming from one centralized location and one common content model. So if you go to the Saturday Night Live website and you download the Saturday Night Live app, that content and all the metadata and that experience is all coming from the same place, though the context is very, very different. So here's a, a specific case of adding an Alexa skill support to NBC's content model. So NBC wanted to create an Alexa skill that would respond to things like, uh, hey Alexa, when is AP Bio on? Or hey Alexa, who's hosting SNL tonight? So we already had a Showtime field in the content model for NBC content. And for those of you who remember looking at television listings or pay very close attention to commercials, you've probably seen some syntax like 9 slash 8C. What that means is 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. That's what that means. But Alexa is going to read this fairly literally. You know, Alexa knows not to read out punctuation, but Alexa is going to say 9-8, see? Now that doesn't make sense to somebody when they hear it aloud. They may be able to look at that and understand 9-8, see, means 9 p.m. 
8 p.m. Central. But 9.8c doesn't make sense when you hear it. So here's what we did. We added a new field to the uh, television content type, television show content type, <clears throat> and we called it Showtime Spoken. And we simply changed the letter C to the word central, and guess what? Now Alexa can say 9.8 central. The developers in the audience are probably thinking, why didn't you just write the Alexa skill so that when it sees the letter C, it reads the word central. The problem with that approach is you have now made it the responsibility of the app to interpret your content when in fact you should make your content experience primary. So if you make your content change here and spell out the word central, you have reduced the amount of coding that you have to do in every spoken device and application from that point forward. You fixed it once and forever. But if we made the application do it, we'd have to duplicate that same logic in Alexa and Apple's device and Siri and uh, uh, Google and everywhere else, right? So if you change it in the content model, you changed it everywhere. So when that content is modular, it can uh, easily be published to different experiences, not just device-specific contexts. Here's an example. So let's say you have a piece of text content, text-based content. Well, that belongs in certain kinds of sites. Like this may be a press release, for example. So you put it on your website, you put it on your event microsite, and you send it out to your feed. But let's say you have a video. So that video, that belongs in certain places and not others. It makes sense on the website and the iPhone app and your streaming devices, but you know, not necessarily sending it out to Alexa or, or maybe it's not relevant to your microsite or blog. You get to pick where that content gets submitted. But you also have, have or should have a transcript of that video, right? Something that can be searchable, that can be read, that helps with uh, accessibility. So that transcript version, that new experience of that content should be sent to specific kinds of devices and experiences and contexts. So it's the same piece of content, but it's being delivered in different formats based on the user's context and need when they receive it. One interesting use case I think that's particularly cool for uh, those who work in the public sector or deal a lot with grants um, and, and have to make data publicly accessible. The same API that you've built to connect all of these different websites and experiences and devices, you can make this publicly accessible and you can document it. And now you have fulfilled your obligation to the public or um, whatever kind of compliance you need to meet to make your data accessible publicly. So if you expose it, you're fulfilling various requirements, you're getting kind of getting that for free. And here's an interesting case study. I mentioned fan sites. Well, this really happened. So we built a decoupled site for a podcasting and video casting network called uh, Twit, This Week in Tech. Their audience is almost exclusively developers, highly technical audience. These are people who love to, to try new things and hack away on stuff. And This Week in Tech thought, man, wouldn't it be really cool if we just made all of our content, we're making a decoupled site anyway, we just opened up that API to all of our fans so they had real content to work with when building their first Apple TV app or their first uh, blog or their first um, whatever they're trying to do, Roku device, uh, Roku app. So they, they, as a service to their communities, to their, their fans, they, they made their content, real content, publicly accessible. But here, here's the cool part. They then got their fans to do all of their work for them for free. So they have dozens and dozens of apps out in the wild created by their fans for them at no cost to them. That's pretty cool. So what does this look like to a content creator? Uh, on the content creation side, editors will, again, we're looking into the very near future, in some cases today, right now, will routinely work with modular content in the form of blocks or components. So in the broader web world, we actually call this blocks, but in Drupal, because that word's kind of taken, we say components, or in some cases, we just refer to it by the module that's very popular, paragraphs. So this is what it, it looks like. On the left, you see a finished piece of content as the, the user, reader, audience member sees it. But on the back end, there's actually lots of metadata and lots of different pieces that are resorted and, and reformatted and clicked and dragged and moved around. So there's a bit of text and there's an image and that image has some metadata associated with it and tagging and all of that. 
this kind of editing experience is going to become extraordinarily common and may actually be what is expected uh, from people who, who write the content and the sites that you maintain. This is the new uh, pa pre-packaged editor for WordPress called Gutenberg. If you haven't tried it yet, you should, because this is what people now expect. They expect very simple block-based editing. All of these blocks can be edited separately, reordered, and assembled in this very clean interface. But there is a Drupal port of Gutenberg. Version 1.0 is released on June 11th. And it is theoretically production ready. I haven't tried it myself, but it is theoretically production ready. Check it out. Gutenberg is maybe not the, could be the editing experience that, that, that your editors expect, but it is certainly uh, the vanguard of what is the new norm in editing experiences on the web. Speaking of, prediction three, content creators are finally going to get the tools that they deserve. So as Paragraphs and Gutenberg demonstrate, there's an explosion of interest in creating better editorial experiences. So coupled with the need for modular content, this has led to new ways of thinking about and assembling content. I suspect that we will see a similar interest in standalone CMS agnostic editing interfaces that are portable. By that I mean your a, a reporter or an editor or a site maintainer may show up in your office and say, you know what, I really like using XYZ editor. And so you just install it for them. And maybe the person sitting next to them prefers ABC editor, and you can install that for them. And people use the editing interfaces that they prefer, but they all tie back to the same content model. Because guess what? Those two things aren't necessarily tied together. So you can decouple on the back end as well. You can decouple the editing interface as well as the experience of the content on the front end. Here are some examples. Uh, oh, meanwhile, rather, shifting gears, hosted services like Gather Content or Contentful uh, are going to compete with one another to create better editorial experiences totally outside of traditional CMSs. These are hosted services. You pay a subscription fee for access to this. So Gather Content, shown here, is focused on content management at all levels content workflow, content governance, campaign management, they market themselves as a content operations hub. Meanwhile, Contentful is focusing very much on the API first uh, CMS experience. So still focused on editorial experience, but it's more developer driven, more um, wanting to build an API around decoupled architectures. And one of the common complaints that we all have heard is the inability to preview content before publishing. Well, enter something like Gatsby Preview. Here's a, a rather silly example of, of this in action. So it's Contentful on the left, making updates, just kind of smashing the keyboard here. And here's an open window, Gatsby Preview on the right, automatically refreshing. That page wasn't saved on the left. And this is a real representative, not quite production site, but publicly accessible URL that you can just open up in another tab and look at as you edit your content. This kind of experience is doable right now, and there are efforts to merge Gatsby Preview and Drupal. So you can start editing nodes in Drupal, have another window open, look at what your content looks like without having to save or preview. We're also seeing really bold new ways to make traditional CMSs more editor-friendly overall. So this is a, a, a system called DX8, which is built on Drupal. Uh, this is built by an organization called Cohesion. DX8 aims to reduce the amount of development needed to produce great content and user experiences. Here's a tool that we built at Four Kitchens. It enables component-driven development for Drupal theming and design. It was released two years ago, and after only two years, it has almost 65,000 installations. I'm not bragging. I'm demonstrating the demand for the tools that enable content creators and designers to do their job more quickly and without having to interact with code. Looking ahead, content creators and designers are going to expect a lot more from their tool sets. So Emulsify, for example, is not just a theming and prototyping tool, it's also a living style guide. It allows your entire organization to see a version of your style guide that is powered by the same code that runs your website. So when you make a change to your, your department's or organizational style guide, design library, 
that same change changes your website instantaneously. So that big book that you keep, you know, in a dusty basement somewhere that says style guide, let's dust that off, put it online, and make it the actual code that powers your digital presence. That's what tools like this are intended to do. Prediction 4 CMSs are going to focus on very specific verticals and very specific use cases. So we're seeing a lot of this already, of course, with things like marketing automation platforms, newsletter and email management tools like Sail Through, uh, constituent and campaign management platforms like Personify. All of these are especially strong in some verticals. But what's interesting is that the rise of CMSs, uh, what's interesting is the rise of CMSs specifically targeted to media, entertainment, and publishing. And all of this will have ripple effects on, on everybody here as well. So here's an example of a, uh, this is a Drupal distribution called Thunder that is specifically built for publications. It's sponsored, maintained, and used by Hubert Berta Media, which is one of Germany's largest publishers. Here we have the Washington Post's CMS Arc, which they have uh, monetized. You can now hire, essentially, the Washington Post to uh, build your website for you using their CMS. Uh, what's interesting is they really focus on newsrooms. So they're, they're really about newsroom management and content monetization. These are the, the, the key words that you see when you look through their materials. Not to be outdone, Vox Media has also made their CMS available. It's called Chorus. So do you see the sub-trend happening here? All three of these CMSs were created by large media companies and made available to you, the public, or anybody who wants to pay for them. In the case of Thunder, it's free. These are made available through open source or proprietary means. Publishing companies are becoming software companies. They're trying to reduce and recoup their costs by releasing their internal products. So I wonder what other organizations are going to start shifting gears. What's interesting in particular about Arc and Chorus is, um, just as an aside, for anybody here who has, has ever worked on a website that has some kind of promotional space in the wireframe or an ad, uh, you usually build the wireframe and there's your headline and the byline and the story and then there's this sort of gray box that you stick in the right rail and it just says ad or promo or something like that, right? So that's how we tend to think about ads and, and, and promotional calls to action and stuff like that. It's that gray box, I don't know, somebody. this is somebody else's problem. Arc and Chorus flip that whole thing on its head. They are focused on that box. That box is the only thing they care about. And then the content is the big gray box. I don't know, put your content there, whatever. We care about selling it. So all of this is getting turned on its head. Arc and Chorus and all the rest also do some really interesting things with machine learning. So let's say that there's a really big story on WAPO and uh, it's getting a lot of traffic. Well, WAPO has things like reg walls and pay walls, so they want you to register to see a couple more articles, and then they want you to pay for a subscription, as they should, that's fair. But they also have the capability using ARC to throttle that, and they can throttle it automatically using machine learning. By throttling, I mean, let's say their normal reg wall cutoff is three articles. You get three articles for free until you gotta pay or sign up. Well, if there's, if there's a big news day and, and they really want you to hang out on the site for a while and they want to capture that advertising traffic, the site may automatically up that limit to five or six free articles on its own. No human intervention. Their job is to monetize the content. That's where CMSs are headed in the publishing space. Speaking of machine learning, prediction number five, machine learning will help us manage and create content. CMSs can now read, see, and hear your content, literally. This is a paradigm shift that's gonna happen in the background and you're not really gonna be aware of it. For example, Google's constantly introducing machine learning features and functionality uh, into its, its tools and products. How many people here have seen the autocompletes in Gmail, both G Suite, there, eerily accurate, right? If they know how you talk. Guess how they know how you talk? They've been watching you for years and years and they have data of every email you've ever read or written or sent 
and they're predicting how you talk, the words you use, the idioms you employ. It's essentially just a content management system. So your CMS in the near future is going to feel out of touch if it can't do things like that. Machine learning is going to drastically simplify media management. Audio, images, video, things like that. Before now, you have to tell your CMS where content belonged. You would have to say, file this under that category and tag at these things and put it here in the menu system. With the help of machine learning, it could just do that for you. It's going to do all the card sorting for you. It's going to do all of the tagging for you, categorization. And it's going to do it better than you ever could. And it's going to find interesting edge cases that are unique to specific people and subgroups. So imagine a content management system that manages its own content, organizes its own content on the fly, all the time, always reorganizing. So this is also true of media management. You have all these images that you upload well. There's uh, automatic tagging of images, there's image recognition software. Uh, that helps with things like accessibility. Uh, but uh, the main thing to keep in mind with machine learning is machine learning is 100% by definition a product of its training and the biases employed by the people who built it. And there are serious risks there. All you have to do is Google something like image auto tag fail and you will see truly abhorrent examples of image auto tagging gone terribly terribly wrong. So we need to be careful about how we employ machine learning because of the biases that by definition it just simply reinforces. Machine learning doesn't really learn so much as it's just constantly told what to think. A little more disturbing maybe is that CMSs are actually going to create your content in the future. So. 2017, Digiday, which is a, a media um, uh, analysis group and newsletter, reported that Washington Post had published 850, 850 AI-generated articles within its first year of production. This included 500 articles about the 2016 U.S. elections. And those 500 articles generated more than half a million clicks. Now, for the Washington Post, that's kind of a drop in the bucket, but, quote, not a ton in the scheme of things, but most of these were stories that the Post wasn't going to dedicate staff to anyway. So now newspapers, or anybody, can employ machine learning to do the work that otherwise gets ignored. <coughs> Washington Post basically published two kinds of articles that year, coverage of the 2016 election and high school football games. And this is what a high school football game summary looks like when written entirely by artificial intelligence the Landon Bears shut out the visiting Whitman White Vikings 34-0 on Friday. Landon opened up the game with a 90-yard kickoff while we'll play by play by play by play, right? This is written by a computer. Fast forward only a year and a half. The New York Times Associated Press Reuters, Yahoo Sports, all use AI to write stories. And in March, the Press Association, which is the UK's equivalent of the Associated Press, claimed that they publish 30,000 local news stories per month using AI. But CMSs won't just write content, they're going to interpret the emotional tones of stories and they're going to react accordingly. And so some publishers are already employing sentiment analysis in ad delivery to avoid embarrassing ad placements. So for example, if you have an article that's critical of Dow Chemical, you would better not show a Dow Chemical ad on that page, right? But if it's a positive article about Dow Chemical, go ahead and put some ads on there. How does it know if it's negative or positive? It found the words Dow Chemical, so it can tag it Dow Chemical, but you'd better get it right that it's good or bad. They're already doing this. Here's an example of sentiment analysis in the wild. So for DrupalCon this year, we wanted to see just how easy it was to build a content management system that uses machine learning to produce content. So we built something called HappyGram. You can check it out at happygram.ai. This is a Drupal-powered website that turns happy memories into shareable postcards. Here's how it works. Somebody came up to our booth and we said, give us a happy memory. We wrote it in this text box. Somebody came up and said, I ran into an old friend. I'm about to go visit him in Costa Rica in June and I'm really excited about that. Well, first we did some entities and syntax analysis. We ran this through Google's natural language processing API. 
And we found that the two most uh, uh, important entities in this statement were friend and Costa Rica. Then we took some phrases and combined some things. This is all done automatically. Old friend, Costa Rica run, be about, it's not perfect. Uh, and then it submitted these phrases to a image search engine. Uh, we used Unsplash, which is a Creative Commons licensed image library. So we sent these search terms over to this thing called Unsplash, and it returned a bunch of images. And the person who submitted the memory then had an opportunity to choose the four images that they felt best supported their story or best told their story. So there's a moment of human interaction in here, right? The human supplies the original phrase, then gets shown a bunch of images, picks the ones that they like, and then we do some other stuff to it. So then we determine the sentiment. Is this a negative memory, neutral memory, positive memory? This one ranked 0.4, so it's, it's up there a bit. What do we do with that? We crank up the saturation level of the images. More colors, brighter colors, happier, right? Then we categorize that memory. Here are the categories that we're using a 20,000 uh, 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 data set of, of 20,000 different statements. We were able to find different categories. Bonding, affection, enjoy the moment, achievement, exercise, leisure, nature. Well, this one, this is about people getting together. So the, the machines told us it's about bonding. So in bonding, we then had a filter applied to that, that like an Instagram filter that will change the, the, the hues and, and the, the, the emotional impact of that image. So here we have a tool that takes input from a person, understands what it's about, suggests images to speed up the publishing process, and then manipulates those images based on the appropriate emotional tone of the story. So here's a happy memory on a postcard. Here's one that's about affection, so it's rosy, right? This was all generated by a computer. The use case here, which is kind of interesting, is how do you speed up the production of content by having images automatically found and added to an article, but then how do you also make sure that those images are tonally appropriate? And what kind of post-production can you do to those images to really emphasize what you're trying to convey emotionally in the content that you're publishing? Prediction number six, reality is going to be augmented. So if you've seen me speak in the past couple of years, you've probably heard me talk about how big VR is going to be. I was wrong about that. Uh, I got a little too excited. Uh, VR has some really important use cases in industry and military and gaming and entertainment. It's being used in some very novel and important ways. For example, cognitive behavioral therapy to treat combat PTSD and phobias. But it's really going to remain kind of a separate thing that people decide to go do. Like nobody's really going to have their VR kit on them all the time and they're going to slap a thing on their face and tune out to the rest of the world. It, it's just probably not going to happen like that. But AR, augmented reality, it's already here. It's already happening. It has been for a while. And the potential is huge, precisely because it's so subtle and useful. This is a new tool called Google Lens that was discussed just last month. So according to CNET, it, quote, feels like a pair of smart glasses without the glasses. The camera-enabled app can already be used for object recognition, translation, shopping, and recognizing the world. In this example here, Google Lens is highlighting a menu's most popular choices based on data it's gathered from restaurant reviews. So it's reading the menu, it's looking all of that up on Google reviews, it's highlighting the options that are most popular in those reviews, and then you can tap on each of those items to get a series of images photos that people have taken of their food at the restaurant for that specific dish. This exists right now. And here's a, an example that Google has trotted out again and again of uh, like, what if we had sort of a, a Wikipedia uh, experience where, you know, here's the, here's the space suit, I want to see what that looks like, I want to see a 3D model, right? There's, there's some 3D models in the wild right now. <clears throat> and that's the desktop version, but, but here's the mobile version of that. Because the, the mobile device has some additional capabilities. It has AR capability, it has a camera. So there's this little AR icon in the bottom, right? Well, what happens when you tap that? Well, now you have this AR view of, of, of a spacesuit that's life-size and you can walk around it and 
spin it around and do all of those things. And this is one of those examples that I kind of trotted out of, like, isn't it going to be cool when, when we can? Well, they just went ahead and did it. And I'm going to come back to this later, but you can search for things on Google right now and see AR 3D models in life size projected on the floor in front of you. This is all content. 3D content. AR and VR experiences are rooted in three-dimensional content, so it's no surprise that we're seeing an explosion of 3D assets and related services. This is just another form of content. So here's a website called Sketchfab. Sketchfab is like Shutterstock, but for 3D models. It's a massive marketplace where people can buy, sell, trade, uh, uh, things that are, are, are built in CAD or using other pieces of software. Some are very high quality and have licensing fees. Some are really lo-fi and just kind of cutesy and cartoony. But you know, here's just a search for tractor. This extends also to 3D printing. Here's a website called Pinshape. Pinshape is just like the previous site, except you download plans to 3D print stuff. So this is a Shutterstock for printable objects. There's millions. When researching for this talk, I, I pulled our team. I asked everybody on our team, like, what do you think the future of content is? And the most interesting response I got was, this is Chris Martin, one of our, our developers, who said, he believes that the new space race will result in an explosion of 3D printing technology that will finally make this something that is more accessible to everybody here in the room. The main reason for that is, if you're going to really establish a colony on the moon or go to Mars or things like that, we can't really take everything we could possibly ever need with us. We need to bring the raw materials with which we can make the things we need on demand and then recycle them over and over and over again. So here, I'm on a middle of a 12-month journey to Mars, I need this wrench, I'm going to go print one out. And when I'm done with it or when it's broken or, or you know, it, it, the little gear thing doesn't turn or whatever, I just melt it down in the recycler and it gets made into another wrench. This is all content that we manage, that has metadata, that's accessible via the web, that we download, that we use. Prediction 7. Content delivery will be context specific. By that I mean content will be delivered to you based on where you are, what you are doing, and what you are trying to achieve. A great example of this is the shift in iTunes. If you haven't heard already, iTunes is going away. And for those of you who've had to plug in your phone and load up iTunes to do a backup and you think, why am I doing this? This doesn't make any sense. This is hopefully a, a, a relief to you. So when iTunes was uh, launched in January 2001, hard to believe it's been that long, it was a game changer and it became the go-to music store. It, it totally upended an entire industry. But then they started adding other media, movies, TV shows, podcasts, and of course podcasts were basically invented for and because of the iPod. 18 years later though, iTunes is, quote, a relic of a different era in which people bought all their, mu all their music and movies in one place. So now they're splitting iTunes into these separate apps, podcasts, TVs, movies. If you use iOS devices, you've already seen this. This has been the case for a while, but this is happening on, de on desktop Mac OS. So these are all context-specific examples of content delivery. Now Apple's announcement followed shortly on the heels of Google adding, quietly as they tend to do, playable podcast episodes in search results in line. So if you search for fairly popular podcasts like Reply All, great podcast about the internet and internet culture. Here are the last three episodes playable right there in search results. Of course, it's taking you to their preferred platform because the podcast wars are coming and everybody wants a piece of, of that pie. Here's another example, and please don't take out your phones just yet because this is usually where I lose people because everybody wants to try this, but please just wait like another five minutes and then you can try it. So let's say you're on your laptop and you search for dog. This is what you get. Wikipedia article, some photos of a dog, pretty typical stuff. That's what we all expect from Google search results. But on a mobile device, you get something very different. So here we are looking at this 3D object on our phone. Spin it around, zoom in and out. See that little button at the top that says AR? Oh, well, let's just drop this dog on the floor and Take a look. There are dozens and dozens of animals, and it's a bit of an Easter egg hunt to find out which ones they've modeled, and they're animated. This is just in search results. 
And they just went ahead and did it. Prediction eight, distribution channels will be restricted and monetized. Streaming services are being built around exclusive content. CBS All Access is a great example of this. CBS launched All Access in about 2016. It provides access to streaming only content like The Twilight Zone, Star Trek Discovery, and the upcoming Picard. By August 2018, it had 2.5 million subscribers. Less than two years later, 2.5 million people paying to see basically two TV shows. In January this year, NBC announced that they are entering the streaming wars. They are ending their deals with Netflix and Hulu. You want to watch The Office? You want to watch Seinfeld? You want to watch Friends? You'd better pay NBC directly because it won't be on Netflix and it won't be on Hulu anymore. So we are seeing a fractured content delivery landscape there. I mentioned money and podcasts. Boy, oh boy. Uh, I don't have time to go into the statistics. There is so much money in podcasts. It's a really big deal. It's a huge business. People are investing a ton of money and things are consolidating and getting very strange. Spotify in particular is just gobbling stuff up. One final word before I go. I'm running a little low on time and I, I don't want to impinge on, on the next presenter's time. Uh, so advertising, when you're downloading podcasts, ads are being injected into that MP3 file when you download them. This isn't some editing thing that happened weeks ago in a studio and they're like, oh, we're going to make sure Casper gets their mattress advertised in this podcast. No, they know you. They know stuff about you, they, the computers. The computers know things about you. And they are going to inject an ad that is most relevant to you the moment you download it. So it's looking at where you are, what app you're using, what other podcasts you subscribe to, right? That ad experience is not universal, even in podcasts. It's custom to you. Last, last thing about advertising, just to freak you out a bit. So when you see, most websites you go to now that are advertising powered, when you see that ad, you should know that. That ad was auctioned off just for you and you alone. That that ad was bought and paid for by a highest bidder that collected all the information it could about you, was sent to a central exchange of, of data, and a bunch of computers within milliseconds all fought for your attention, and the one that chose to pay 57 cents instead of 56 cents got to display their ad. Every time you see an ad, that's happening behind the scenes with your information. So let's summarize. CMSs will be content repositories, not website managers. Content will be extensible and modular. Content creators will finally get the tools they deserve. CMSs will focus on specific verticals and use cases. Machine learning will help us manage and create content. Reality will be augmented. Content delivery will be context specific. And distribution channels will be restricted and monetized. I don't have time for questions. I want to thank you for your time. I'll be outside if you want to talk. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful conference.